So I haven't done some painting in a while, so I want, I want to do a painting. Um, now, a lot of times when you start artwork, you you have an idea. You're going to, oh, I want to do a painting of uh, this animal, or I want to do a painting of this person, or this place, or this city, or I want to make a boat, I want to make an airplane. But art doesn't always have to be pictures of things. So let's talk about that. Um, this is something that's going to be familiar from class. So anytime you're looking at a visual artwork, whether it's a painting or a sculpture or a drawing or anything, there's one of three big categories that that artwork can fall into. So the first one is what we call realism. Now realism is when you're making any artwork that tries to basically look like the thing it's showing. So this would be an example of what we call uh, realism. Now this is not hugely realistic. Because realism doesn't mean it has to look exactly like a photograph. Some realistic artworks really do look just like photographs. My fourth graders, we looked at the artist Chuck Close. His goal was, at least at first, was to make things look as much like a photo as possible. So this is artwork by a guy named Thomas Hart Benton. And you can see it looks relatively realistic, but there's features that are exaggerated. They look a little cartoonish. Some of the eyes aren't present. But in general, things look like what they are. I can see, you know, there's people sitting there with a banjo, with a guitar, with a fiddle. I can see the cart. The colors generally are what you'd expect them to be. The sky is bluish, the grass is greenish, etc. So even though this may not be perfectly realistic, we'd still probably categorize this painting as realism. So that's our first big category of art, realism, right? So the second big category artworks can fall into is what you call abstraction. Abstract art, for example, here's a famous Pablo Picasso piece of artwork. Again, uh, third and fourth graders, we've looked at Pablo Picasso, so some of this style should look familiar to you. Abstraction is when you take something based in real life and you change it. So maybe you're drawing a picture of a person, but maybe you don't want it to look exactly like a person. So with abstraction, the point of the artwork is not really to make it look like real life. You might be showing things that are real, like cars or animals or people, but the point of the art is not to look like real life. The point is, well, it's something different, and that depends on what the artist is looking for. It might be to express a certain emotion. It might be to make an aesthetically interesting piece to look at, it's really up to you. But that's what abstract art is. You're taking something based in reality and you're abstracting it. So the word abstract actually means to simplify something. Um, so how you simplify it, how you change it, what do you do to it? All of those types of things are totally up to you. So clearly this is an artwork of a person. We can see the person's face. We can see they're wearing a little beret on their head. Um, but yeah, this definitely is not what that person would look like in real life. So Picasso has changed some things. So we have realism, that's our first big category of art. We have abstraction. And then our last big category is what we call non-objective art or non-representational art. Now, those words can be used somewhat interchangeably. Uh, non-objective just means art that doesn't have objects in it. So when you look at this particular painting right here, uh, when you're looking at it, it's there's not objects in it. We don't see a house. We don't see a person. We don't see uh, you know a cat or a dog. We don't see the sun and the ground. There really are no objects in the in the artwork. So we call this non-objective. Or sometimes you'll hear this style of art called non-representational art. And again, what that means is it just doesn't represent anything. This artwork represents a person. This artwork represents presents a group of people in musical instruments and a place. This artwork right here really doesn't represent much of anything, at least as far as we know so far. So anyway, this was painted by a really famous painter named Jackson Pollock. And actually all the artworks I've showed you are related in some way. So Jackson Pollock got famous for doing this type of really loose drip painting. Um, his paintings are enormous. I'm gonna show you a couple of them right now. Um, but typically his paintings were so big, he didn't paint them at a desk. He didn't paint them at an easel. He would put, you know, huge pieces of uh, canvas on the floor and he would walk around on all sides and kind of fling and drip paint on it. I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, uh, the way this, this artworks, the artworks I've showed you are all related is that uh, Jackson Pollock, who painted the one you're looking at right now, was actually taught by this guy, uh, Thomas Hart Benton, who painted this painting. And you might think, well, that's weird that his teacher had such a different style than him. But hey, that happens all the time. I'm, you know, I'm y'all's art teacher and you guys oftentimes have very different styles than me. And that's the whole point of art, it's okay. Everyone doesn't have to do things that look exactly the same. So Thomas Hart Benton uh, actually taught uh, Jackson Pollock as, as he was, uh, you know, becoming an artist. 
Pollock was also influenced a lot by Pablo Picasso. He liked that abstract style. And he ended up kind of bringing his abstraction and changing it as he went. So here's another Jackson Pollock artwork. Now this one you can see looks a lot different than this one. This one is just kind of colors and splats of paint. Whereas this one we can actually see some stuff. Yes, it's very abstract. Over on the left side, I can see what looks like a horse or a donkey or something like that. And what almost looks like a human face turned upside down, we see the eyes. It's very abstract, but we can still tell it's representational of something. So there's some clues in the artwork. Um, as far as I know, this was an untitled artwork. So we don't have a title to kind of help us. Here's another of Jackson Pollock's artworks. Now, when you look at it, you kind of immediately probably think of some things and the title is going to help you with this because the title of this artwork is called The Flame. So clearly when we look at this artwork and especially once we hear the title, even though it doesn't look super realistic, I'm definitely getting some fiery imagery from it, especially with the yellow and oranges kind of in the middle and the reds all moving around in this flame-like pattern. So when you're looking at abstract artworks, names can help you a lot as far as like knowing what you're looking at. Yeah, Pollock had some pretty abstract works. Here's another one of his uh, called Blue. Well, you can see the color blue in there. But it's called blue, and then in parentheses he has uh, the name Moby Dick. If you know Moby Dick at all, that's actually a famous book about a uh, like great whale. So even though this isn't a realistic artwork, I would still definitely uh, call this abstract. We can still we see some things that remind us of water. If you look down at the bottom, I can see some things that remind me of like fish, whales, that type of thing. But it is still very abstract for sure. So uh, the more Pollock did this abstract art, the more abstract his artwork became. Um, it can be hard to really find anything in this one, honestly. But if you look over on the left side, we see something that kind of looks a little bit like a head or a face. And the title of this art artwork is actually, it's called She-Wolf. And so once you know the title She-Wolf, okay, well, I can start to kind of see some legs. And I guess that, that part over there on the left is the head. Um, but it's very, very abstracted. Now, uh, Pollock was really into this abstract thing. And so at some point he started creating artworks that were really so abstract that you couldn't really find any sort of imagery in them. And in other words, they kind of lost their representation. So if this artwork represents a flame or a fire, if this artwork represents, you know, a whale or an ocean from Moby Dick, this artwork represents the she-wolf. Well, when we look at something like this, it becomes very hard to find anything representational in there at all. I just see, you know, splats of color and all sorts of paint mixed together. And even the title doesn't help us very much. The title of this artwork is called Convergence. And the word convergence means when things come together. And I see a lot of paint colors that are coming together. But beyond that, I'm really not sure what this artwork is supposed to show me. Which really brings us to the point, when we're talking about non-objective artwork or non-representational art, it doesn't necessarily have to show you anything. It doesn't need to be a picture of anything. So actually, at some point, uh, Jackson Pollock actually stopped naming his artworks. And he said, well, the problem is when you name an artwork, everyone's going to go looking for that thing. Well, maybe it's just about the art itself. Maybe it shouldn't have a name. Maybe it's not about a thing. So I'm going to show you one of his most famous ones. And this one will become to this one would come to be called uh, Blue Poles. You can see why Blue Poles. There's these vertical kind of stripes of blue paint. But originally, this one actually I don't think had a name. It was just called. A lot of non-objective artists will do this. They won't give their uh, artwork a title. They'll just call it Composition 10 or Composition 12. They'll just put a number on it. So Pollock actually started doing that after a while too. He's like, I don't want you to think of that as blue poles. You know, I want you to just think of it as an artwork and take what you will from it. Um, anyway, like I said, he got really into this um, very non-objective style where he's kind of. Uh, painting from all sides of the canvas. And he, he would, again, these things are huge. I'll show you actually the size of this. So, and that's just part of the artwork that you're seeing compared to a person. So he would have to do these paintings like out in his art studio, which was actually an old barn. 
And he would, again, just lay the canvas on the floor and he would walk around on all sides of it. And he's not necessarily using like a paintbrush to paint this. He would use all sorts of different things. Really, whatever he could find, he'd use spoons and sticks and he'd just kind of slap the paint on the canvas any way he wanted. Now, he did have an intentionality. He did have an idea. He wasn't just kind of going crazy with it. But I think for a lot of people who look at Jackson Pollock's art, you might just look at it and think, well, it's just kind of random paint slapped around. And in fact, when he started doing this, a lot of people did not get it. A lot of people said, oh, this isn't valuable artwork. This is just a bunch of paint mixed around. But again, if you like something and you like doing it and you do it long enough, you're probably going to find other people who find value in it too. So yeah, his artworks generally um, in this phase, and this this is really what he got the most well-known, the most famous for was this style of non-objective art where he's kind of just using paint in any way he can think of. Um, yeah, the sizes of these artworks were typically like massive, absolutely. And this is what he became most famous for, absolutely. So yeah, you got a Jackson Pollock. Oh, this one did have a title, which was The Reflection of the Big Dipper. So I don't know what that means. Um, obviously the Big Dipper is a constellation in the night sky. Um, I guess you could see certain ones of these colors as stars maybe. But yeah, in general, I kind of just like looking at the artwork without trying to find a meaning in it, right? A lot of times with non-objective art, it's just about the aesthetic response. Do you like it? <laughs> Do you like the way it looks? Is it interesting to you? This is certainly interesting. So yeah, um, anyway, I found this <laughs> this picture that I really like of the floor of Jackson Pollock's studio. So you can see kind of the outline of where there was a painting. And obviously after doing, you know, tons of paintings like this, he just, again, the painting would be flat on the floor. He'd walk around. He said he really enjoyed uh, working from all sides of the painting. Um, you know, if you have a painting on a desk or on a canvas, normally you're going to be approaching it from one angle, but he would go around from all sides and, you know, splash paint all around. And he said that really made, made him feel like he was like in the painting, right? Um, because he got to approach it from all sides. So yeah, that's Jackson Pollock for you and non-objective art. So what I'd like to do is figure out a way today that I can kind of just get some paint and make some color and make some interesting non-objective art on a piece of paper without really uh, trying to make a picture of anything at all. So this is what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to see if I can use some different techniques and some different paints to do it. And if you've got any paint at home, non-objective art can get a little messy. So <laughs> make sure you uh, have, you know, materials and make sure you're not making a mess and making your <laughs> parents angry at you. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and try some different things to do some non-objective art today. So I have a big box that I'm going to try to, uh, or actually it's the top of a box that I'm going to use kind of as a placemat to try to make sure paint's not splatting everywhere. I have some, this is actually a little bit thicker. This is more like the paper we'd use in art class where it's got a little weight to it. It's not just computer paper. I'm sure you could do this with just computer paper. It'd probably just get wetter and take longer to dry, which would be fine. So um, I also have, I finally got into school. I have some liquid watercolor paints. I have some tempera paints. I have some acrylic paints. Um, I'm going to start with the liquid watercolor paints just because I think they'll run better, like they'll sp spray better. Um, I've actually mixed up a little bit in the spray bottles, so I'm going to just kind of try out all sorts of different things. Um, Jackson Pollock's artwork, a lot of times they would call it abstract expressionism. And the expression comes from this idea that, um, you know, you're kind of walking around this canvas and you're it's, it's like a very raw, like emotional thing, I guess, that you're just kind of acting in the moment, acting on your impulse. Pollock was actually influenced a lot by the Surrealists too. Fifth graders, you know all about um, the Surrealists. So there's a lot kind of that went into this style rather than just, oh, I'm gonna mix up some paint. But also it can be fun to just kind of mix up some paint. So I'm gonna see what I can do slightly influenced by Jackson Pollock, but also of course, slightly influenced by whatever I feel like doing because that's the expression in expressionism. Um, one more time, I just want to point out uh, <laughs> Jackson Pollock's floor on his studio. So yeah, last time I'll say it, but make sure you're not making a huge mess in your 
family's home. <laughs> if any of this stuff seems messy, ask them for help. So yeah, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and just see what I can make. I'm gonna do a bunch of different things. I think some of this stuff I'm gonna let dry and mess with it more maybe tomorrow. Um, some of this stuff I might actually turn into uh, representational art that like has pictures of things. Others I think I'm just gonna leave as random colors and stuff. Let's just see what happens. Hey, let's have fun with it. So uh, I got my big box here. I do have watercolor and I'm gonna start with some of that watercolor. I'm gonna see if I can set this up. This is kind of bigger than I'm used to working. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is try to just kind of move watercolors around in random ways. First thing I'm gonna to do to do that is I'm just literally gonna use bottles of paint and just kind of drip them all over the place. So, okay. Got some yellow. Got some red. Already I've got paint on my hands, so again, doing this type of stuff's a little bit messy. Got some blue. Now from here, there's all sorts of things I could do. I could take a paintbrush and mix it up. I could, uh, you know, I could do whatever I want. And in fact, if I just let it sit there and dry, that might look cool. We'll see. Um, I have a can of compressed air right here. So when you squeeze the trigger, literally all it's doing is blowing air. But you can use air to make some interesting patterns in your art. You're seeing my blues and greens are mixing up. Ooh. Interesting. Ooh, I like that a lot. If you can see that little ripple pattern down there, that looks awesome. I have no clue what this stuff's gonna look like when it dries. But we'll see. Now I may have used way too much paint because a lot of it's just kind of turning dark black as it mixes, but hey, that's okay. So Some of it's starting to dry up. Actually, I like those little tiny branches. I'll show you in just a minute another way you can get those little tiny branches of color to come out. So this is really cool. I got my reds and oranges mixing over here. A nice patch of blue in the middle. Some nice greens fading into yellows up here. Again, as this dries, it might get lighter, it might get darker. The honest truth is I'm not really sure. And we'll see if I decide to use this for something else later. If I want to put more on top of it, I would have to use another style of paint, maybe tempera. If I put more watercolor on here, it would just uh, blend in. But that might be cool too. Maybe I should try some with uh, mixing with water so it becomes a little bit lighter. I don't know. No. That, as you can see, see, is still soaking wet. So I wanna make sure, obviously, I'm not putting that anywhere where it's gonna drip and ruin some things. I don't know, I'm just gonna let that go sit. Kinda of interesting. So uh, I'm just gonna try a bunch of different things. For now, I'm gonna take that and I'll be right back and we'll do another one. Cool, so uh, I've got that one over there drying somewhere and I'm just gonna try a bunch more stuff. Um, the colors were super vibrant in that one, super intense. So what I might do with this one, I'm still gonna try some watercolors. I'm gonna take just a little bottle of just plain old water first. I'm gonna try using more water, kind of get some parts of my paper really wet, kind of have some parts of my paper a little bit drier. And I'm gonna try using less paint and see if they kind of blend together. So let's just see, maybe I'll do just little drops here and there. And again, I'm just using red, yellow, and blue because they're my primary colors. And I feel like, you know, you'll get some good mixes of color in there using those. Hopefully it all won't just turn black or brown. Now, one thing I could do is just 
drip my painting like this, just moving it around. Already I've got some red and blue mixing to make purples. So that could start to make some interesting things. Also, you can see where it's spreading out where the paper was already wet. Another thing I could do is I could take a straw and actually blow the paint around the paper specifically how I want it. Now, obviously with viruses and sicknesses and stuff going around, ask somebody before you do this. It's not necessarily a great idea to be blowing your breath all over your house. So talk to someone first, but hey, I'm gonna give it a shot. I'm not actually touching the paper at all. I'm just pointing the straw where I want my paint to go. And this gives us, I told you earlier, I'd give you a way to kind of get more of those little branchy looking things. In fact, I've done some paintings where I made trees using this method. They turned out pretty cool. You see why uh, when Jackson Pollock painted this way, they called it action painting because you have to get up and kind of move all around. Now, I'm not sure Pollock would have been sitting here using a straw and watercolor paints. He probably would have been using uh, all sorts of different things. Getting some greens there, getting a little bit of brown in the middle. I've also uh, done some artworks using this technique where they end up looking almost like fireworks if you do just one little spot of color here and there. For example, let's do green. I think I got a bottle of green. I'm just gonna put a little green right here. One little drip. Actually, I like that little bit of green. Gotta add a little more. Oops, I had an extra drip. That one went all the way through there. And again, picking a color scheme could probably help. I'm just using haphazard colors. Something with mostly blues or purples or something like that might look cool. All right, I'm gonna let that one sit and we'll start a new one in just a moment. But clearly, you know, if you're looking at that, well, what is that a picture of? And you might say, uh, that little brown and green part reminds me of a tree or hey, uh, that reminds me of like rainbow over there where it's all mixing. Sure, <laughs> but uh, certainly I wasn't trying to make those things. So I would just consider this non-objective art, but hey, I could give it a title. Maybe I would call this, uh, uh, you know, Land of the Triceratops or something. And then you're looking in the artwork, you're looking at it going, where's the dinosaur? Where's the dinosaur? So the way you title artworks like matters a lot. Anyway, I'm going to go let this one sit and we'll start a new one. All right, so for my next one, I want to do just some kind of broader areas of color. I might need to water down some of this watercolor paint, but we'll see. So I have a little bottle of red and blue and it's in a little spray bottle. Let's see how this goes. Ooh, I love it. Ooh, the blue one shoots like tiny little, oh yeah. That's pretty cool. Now if I put, I wonder if I put yellow, will it start to blend and make green? Not if I put it on red. <laughs> There we go. And I'm really liking the kind of scatter spray effect here. Let's get some purple down in here. Got some blue, let's get some red. Oh, that was way too much red, I think. But this, I'm, I'm liking the spray a lot. Now I wonder if I mix sprays of this and sprays of water, how that'll do. I might just leave that one like that. I kind of like it. I liked it a lot better before I did all that red, unfortunately. Let's see if we can add some more blue, get some more purple in there. Yeah, the blue one's not spraying as well as the others, but hey, this is whatever I had lying around my house, right? 
Hmm. Should we try doing some spray water on top? Will that ruin everything? So what the water is going to do, even though it doesn't look like it does anything immediately, when you sp spray just plain water on it, that water is going to spread out and it'll kind of, as it dries, it'll create more of like a blobby look to it. I might do a little more blue up there and call this one done. Guess there's no such thing as a little bit. <laughs> Interesting. Zoom that in a little bit here. I really like the kind of spray pattern that's showing up. Now this, using different tools, obviously is gonna give you different results. So things like, you know, painting with toothbrushes or painting with eyedroppers where you're just dripping color on. I guess I did a little bit of that earlier, just right out of the paint bottle. So when you're doing this kind of abstract expressionist or what I would call non-objective or non-representational painting where this isn't really supposed to be anything, um, you know, there's not really rules. It's a lot of fun. You can kind of just do whatever you want. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let that one dry and we'll start a new one in just a minute. All right, so, so far I've been using uh, liquid watercolor for this. If you don't have liquid watercolor, which I, I think most people don't have this, I actually never used liquid watercolor at all until I started teaching art and now I love it. You could also use just like spray bottles of water and food coloring if your parents have that. I think oftentimes it gives a similar thing. It might not quite dry as bright, but uh, you could try something like that. You could also take tempera paint or uh, acrylic or something like that and try watering it down. Again, sometimes you gotta do experiments in art. So what am I about to do? Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of an experiment. Where I'm gonna wet my paper down just a little bit. And I'm gonna take this bottle of water and I'm gonna mix in just a teeny little bit of blue in here. And if some blue gets on my paper, oh, which just happened, if some blue gets on my paper, I'm not gonna super worry about it. Ooh, you know what else I can do? I can take this actual, because this sprayer still has blue in it. Again, this is why you need to ask your parents first, because uh, <laughs> I'm getting paint all over my hands here. And as I'm spraying that, it's becoming lighter and lighter because it's adding the water from my bottle. Okay, okay. Interesting. Let's see how we can combine other techniques here. Maybe I'll try a little bit of my air, air bottle here. There's that kind of firework look I was talking about earlier. Ooh, combining these, starting to get interesting. I think I'm going to take this and I'm going to add to it once it's dry. So maybe this will actually be a picture of something. Maybe I'll do a something on top of this. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. Let's do uh Maybe we'll actually add a ground to this one. Why not? Get a little bit of green. Couple drops of maybe we need some more of that blue. Again, I'm not exactly sure what we're doing here, but I kind of like it. Like how, ooh, now I'm getting a mixture of the blue and the water. I think I'm out in that bottle. Cool. Another thing you could try doing, and a lot of, of y'all have done this in art class. So if you're gonna do it, just make sure you, you know, have your area clean and have your parents' permission because they're not gonna wanna find drips everywhere. You could take some of this paint on my paintbrush and just kind of drip it like that. 
Now, the only problem with that is you got paint going all over the place. So unless you, this is like an outdoor thing, probably. I'm not even sure I should be doing this anywhere near my computer, but that's pretty cool. So actually, I'm going to let this one dry, I think, just like it is. And then maybe I'll come back tomorrow and add some more stuff to this one. Oh, by the way, I've done a couple videos where I painted earlier and I was showing you like how to stencil paint. These would be great techniques to use together. Um, so I might go back and do some more like stenciling type stuff on top of some of those uh, tomorrow. But yeah, any type, time you're doing this kind of paint all over the place, that works great with stenciling too. Um, so I'm going to try to do some tempera now and I have no clue how this is going to go. We're about to find out. So we got a sheet in there, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try legit just like rolling some marbles around and some paint splats and see what that gives me. Maybe it'll be interesting, maybe it won't. Maybe temper is a bad idea, maybe it'll work. You know what, let's do a We're going to stick to that yellow and blue and green kind of color scheme I had going on. I like that. Maybe a little bit of white to lighten up some of these. I don't know. We're about to see what this is going to do because I have no idea. No idea. And that's the fun. Sometimes having no idea what you're doing. I've been dropping paint tops. <laughs> Sometimes that's the most fun. So let's see if this will even work. So the idea is just that the marbles are going to kind of randomly track this paint all over different areas. And they're doing that. I think if I had more marbles, it might be working a little bit better. But uh, hey, again, I got what I got at home. Right? It's definitely great. That actually almost looks more Jackson Pollocky than anything I just did with the watercolors, if I'm being honest. I think I could sit here and probably do that for like 30 more minutes. Do I, I'm going to put my paintbrush. You know what? Pollock used some weird stuff. Maybe I don't need a paintbrush. Maybe I need, maybe I can just use my straw or something. I'll use, I'll start by using a paintbrush. This adds a little bit of intentionality. I'm actually making some choices, but I'm going to go back and uh, let the marbles do some more work too here. In fact, let's do that right now. Just got to make sure I'm not like tilting it too hard or too fast that I got paint covered marbles going all over my house. I already have to go, you know, wash all this stuff out in the sink when I'm done. I'm liking the green. Let's try, let's try adding some watercolor to this. What will that do? I don't know. How does the watercolor interact with the other stuff? I don't know. The little purple too. Actually. Ooh, there we go. The box top I have is like tilted upward, so all the marbles are just staying on the outside and not going through the paint. If we mix watercolor, ooh, getting a little firework burst right here. I don't know why, that's just what I feel. I think one more right here. I like that purple and white mixing together. So, am I doing anything other than making mess? Yes. I'm making art. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Also, my box is starting to look a whole lot like Jackson Pollock's floor. <laughs> Let's pick that up. As you can see right here. <laughs> so I'm going to go uh, put this somewhere to dry and then see what else I can do. All right. I got my marbles <laughs> clean. <laughs> and actually, I don't think I'm going to dirty those up again. I'll leave those just like they are. I think I'm going to do one more. And I'm gonna try uh, not to go totally overboard with this one because I want some uh, I want some dry paintings tomorrow that I can mess with and do some other things too. So uh, let's see what we can do. I'd like some lighter colors on this one. Maybe I'll use that little bottle of blue I mixed with water. And I think I'm just gonna do uh, little tiny bits. Just a little. I want to leave most of my paper kind of white on this one. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't just spray it on my hand. Absolutely not. Wait, didn't you just say you weren't going to go overboard, Gully? I'm not. But I want some green and I want some purple. So we're going to do paintbrush drippies for green and purple. And we'll come back to that and see what I can add to it tomorrow. Green, good to go. Let's add just a little touch of purple in there. And I think I'm gonna call it a day on my drip paintings here. And then we'll see what we can turn them into tomorrow. Depending on how they turn out, maybe I just like them the way they are. Depending on how they turned out, maybe I wanna add more stuff to it. I'm gonna figure out once they're dry. Give me a little bit of Don't spill, don't spill. There we go. I'm gonna do just some purple in around my red kinda. I'm gonna let the green do most of my work for me. Little bit of purple in there. And there's this big empty looking like compositional space there. And I think that's okay because I think I'm going to add something to it tomorrow. I'm not sure what yet. Anyway, uh, that was a whole lot of drip painting. <laughs> so I'm going to go uh, take my last one here, let it dry, clean up my area, clean up my paint brushes, get everything uh, back in its correct bottles. I got a lot of stuff here. Anyway, yeah. Non-objective art, it can be a lot of fun because you're not necessarily trying to make a picture of anything. It's just colors, it's splats, it's lines, it's whatever you like. So yeah, it's one of my favorite styles of art. There's no way to do it wrong. If you like it, you did it right. So yeah, um, hopefully you guys have some paints or something at least that you can do some version of that at home because it can be a lot of fun. Doing it outside is fun too. I've taken some spray bottles. Maybe I need to do one of those. I took some spray bottles one time with uh, my friend's son. He's in first grade now. And we like taped up a bunch of stuff to my fence, just a bunch of papers and just like sprayed them with spray bottles, made whatever we want. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, not objective art, a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, hopefully you guys are doing well. Have a good day, enjoy making art, and I will see you next time.